I'm here at Second Valley in South Australia on a little headland where the landing scenes for the film Gallipoli were shot. I came here to do a little bit of fishing and in fact I caught a couple of salmon there this morning but they were pretty small so I decided I'd go and have a look at the rocks instead and it's a good thing I brought some field gear because there's some really interesting rocks here. The rocks here are strongly deformed but only weakly metamorphosed. Most of them are these carbonaceous to calcareous siltstones and as you can see here they've been isoclinally folded and there's a weak foliation axial planar to those folds. The metamorphic grade is somewhere lower most green schist and the highest grade mineral you'll see is chlorite. They have a, a vague phyllitic sheen on most of the foliation parting surfaces. Most of the time that foliation is parallel to bedding. You only really see that it's at an angle to bedding where it goes through a fold hinge like there. Most of them are like this grey phyllitic siltstone here with a phyllitic foliation parallel to bedding. And as you can see on this bedding plane here, a very strong lineation down dip. There's some carbonates in the sequence. This one here has got that classic fluted weathering surface to tell you that it's calcareous and the light brown colour tells you it's probably dolomitic. There's also some thrust faults here that are almost parallel to bedding and they occasionally cut out the core of isoclinal folds. And here's one of those thrust faults. This is the plane of the fault here, parallel to bedding in the massive carbonates below. And you can see some layered silt stones above and they've got a bit of a drag fold happening there to tell you that it's had some sinistral movement that way. Now, it turns out that these structures are pretty important in controlling mineralization here. And since it's left lateral, you would expect that dilation would be in left-hand bends. But that's actually not the case. There's probably been more than one episode of movement on this structure, and the one that's important for mineralization was probably right lateral. And here's that same structure a little bit further along strike with the massive carbonates below and the bedded siltstones above. And here it takes a right hand bend and where that bend is, there's this beautiful hydrothermal breccia developed. And that's kind of interesting as you'll see in a minute. The lesson here is that big structures like this that control mineralization very often have multiple episodes of movement and they're not always in the same sense or direction. So just because something doesn't look right in the folds you're looking at or the bends you've got, doesn't mean that there's nothing on that structure. You need to look elsewhere if you can see other signs of mineralization. When I first saw these breaches, I thought they might have been rough concrete foundations for some old boat sheds that used to be here. There's also some huge deposits of talus breccia streaming down the cliff face there and getting cemented by calcareous groundwater. So I thought the breccias initially might have been some of those, but as it turns out, they're not. I started to see that the matrix was all carbonate, quartz, and a little bit of gossan, so I figured they must be hydrothermal. And then things got really interesting when I started trying to follow the breccias. In this case, I can see that there's a little squib of breccia following along a structure heading that way, and that structure is actually perpendicular to the thrust fault which is below us. We're in the bedded siltstone here, and along this subsidiary structure that's roughly perpendicular, the breccias have reamed up little breccia pipes along that structure all the way through up into the host rocks above. So here's one of those little baby breccia pipes here. And there's the structure that it's following with a little bit of hydrothermal breccia in there filled with quartz and carbonate and a little bit of gossan, a little bit more gossan there. But the little breccia pipe has reamed its way up the structure and carved out this almost round hole with smooth walls. And you can see some of the clasps in there have quite rounded shapes. So they've been milled as the hydrothermal fluid's been streaming up that structure and reaming out the wall rocks. Now here's another one a little bit further along the same structure where you can see that the breccia and the carbonate cement has been removed by weathering. 
and you can see the remarkably smooth walls of the pipe and there's just a little bit of breccia left in the bottom there. And here's another one of those little hydrothermal breccias coming up a conjugate structure. Here you can see the bedding in the layered siltstone here. So that structure is almost 90 degrees to the orientation of the bedding and hence 90 degrees to the orientation of the bedding parallel thrust which is just a little bit below us here. And in this case you can see that the infill is a mixture of druzy quartz in there, some carbonate in here, and these dark brown patches here are gossen after pyrite. In fact, I found a little piece here that's still got some surviving pyrite in the middle, so I'm pretty sure that's what the sulphide is. So this little headland really has a beautiful microcosm of what you often find in hydrothermal breccia systems. Even though they look like round, irregular pipes, they are actually often controlled by structures and the breccia pipes just find the easiest way up that structure, often in dilational gapes or anywhere there's a weakness in the bedrock due to some intersection of another structure or a major change in rock type. And they don't always follow the big structures. Quite often, like this one here, the best dilation is in conjugate structures that come off the big structures. So that's often where the best mineralization is and particularly that's often where the best open space develops because they're not ground up by the major movements on the big faults which produces a lot of rock flour that fills in all the cavities between the breaches. The smaller breaches on the smaller structures tend to have more open space and generally speaking that means better mineralization because most of the th minerals that we look for love to grow in open space.